three. Beloved 8% Hard AF Seltzer is now live in over 1,200 locations across the United States. We're now available in Florida, Georgia, Alabama, Tennessee, North Carolina, Ohio, and Texas. Go to hardafseltzer.com today, click on the store locator, enter your city or zip, and find the nearest location closest to you. Welcome to Drinking Bros, presented by GhostBed.com. Yeah, welcome to Drinking Bros, kids. We got a banger of a Tuesday show this afternoon. Tulsi Gabbard is here. Aloha. Thanks well, for having me. Mahalo. This has been a long time in the making. It sure has. I'm, I'm glad to actually be able to be here with you guys in person. Did mm -hmm. I respond correctly? You said aloha and I said mahalo. Yeah, aloha or mahalo works. To, to prepare for this interview, I watched Moana last night with my kids. Oh, okay. So I feel Are like I'm in touch. Are you ready to bust out in song? I can. Do I the, tried to get these assholes to, to play. play it as you were walking in. <laughs> as you were walking in. That would have been in. pretty awesome. Yeah, they're yeah. fucking the, cowards back there. I can do the old man voice. <laughs> okay. Moana. Uh, that's pretty good. Thank you. That's pretty that's good. That's off the cuff. Yeah. You know? They're coming out with the second one. They right are. Here. And yeah. they're doing a live this action time version as well. This exactly. time it's personal. It sure is, yeah. It's like Moana, too. She's got a chainsaw and shit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> she's ready. <laughs> yeah, she's, she's going after Taking the fires. Taking on, like, the full warrior persona, I She's going to stop the fires in this one. Yeah. Uh, look. Oh, she's going to go up against Oprah then. She sure is. Yeah. Is that what to. happened? Uh, do you guys believe in that conspiracy theory that Oprah started the fires? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just start there. I think Billy Joel did, to be honest with oh, you. I don't, um, I don't know if Billy Joel, what is he, five foot three? He's not starting fires. He's starting fires. He had a huge song about it. Uh, Tulsi, you're, you're in a crazy moment in history right now. Yeah. You're rumored rumored, we're, we'll get to the bottom of it here, to mm. be uh, the potential VP pick for not one, but two presidential candidates. Uh, one came from D'Anthony, D'Anthony Holloway himself, okay. thought you were going to run with RFK Jr. Um, now, I had read that as well, and it was, it was a fun story at the time. It appears as if he's picked somebody as of yesterday, the entrepreneur chick who nobody's ever heard of but has a lot of money. Uh, correct. Bryn something? No, that was her ex-husband, Brin. Oh, Sergey Brin was her ex. Yeah. So yes. Sergey Brin is one of the founders of Google. Yes. Oh, gotcha, gotcha, yes. gotcha. That explains and all Larry the money. Page. Yes, and yes. he needs money apparently. Uh, I don't know. Oh, RFK does. I was thinking of Sergey. No, Sergey is all set. Sergey doesn't. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he's fine, but RFK does. Yeah, you know, running obviously running for president in any situation costs a lot of money. Mm -hmm. I think the average candidate this year is going to spend four billion. For the two major parties, it last last time was like two point five total, and that that's yeah, including total the that, that includes and the super yeah. PACs yeah. and all of yeah. kind of the. Um, but but to also, I mean, I mean, he's chosen a very hard path. It's hard to run for president in general. He chose a Democratic primary, then dropped out midstream and decided to run as an independent. And to run as an independent, you're taking on both political parties and the propaganda media and big tech and mm -hmm. all of these forces who essentially profit and benefit from uh, being a part of the cabal of the power mm. elite. And so to have, a, have someone who's, who's uh, able to run a serious campaign as an independent is a threat to them. So uh, the, the money thing, is, is, and this is a whole topic in and of itself, but the money thing, as much as you might not like it, is a practical reality when you're essentially waging an information warfare, mm -hmm. information warfare, uh, as they are. Yeah, because it's costly. Yeah, uh, and you got to get all these people on your side. You got to go yeah. out there and buy them you gotta, out. You, and you have to. And you have to. You know, you've got to have. Like they ran a seven million dollar ad during the Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. Debatable whether that was the best use of seven million dollars mm -hmm. when you don't have a lot of money. But uh, you know, that's that's what it costs. You got to get your name out there. You got to get your message out there. And what I found when I ran for president in twenty twenty was that uh, you know even on a like who knows if there's going to be presidential debates. This mm -hmm. year, that's a valid question that this norm that's existed forever, it may not happen at all. And for a candidate like Bobby Kennedy, I know he's counting on and has been counting on being able to stand on a stage with President Biden and President Trump and and have that opportunity to make his case to the American people. I don't know that he'll get that. Oh, that's definitely not happening. You don't think so? But, no. <laughs> well, do you, like, no, no, do you no. think Biden won't even sign off on any of these debates? Because if he doesn't, Trump's not going to. I, I think which there's means an, Bobby doesn't get a shot on stage. There's an outside shot. They'll 
pump him full of Adderall like they did the other day for the State of the Union mm -hmm. and let him go after it. But it's risky, man. It I mean, is. I think it would be more likely than a direct one-on-one -on -one debate. It would be more town hall style where the moderators only ask questions. But you know Trump, right? He's just going to go off. Yeah. So. Right. And, and, and the debates are important, especially for a candidate who's trying to get their name out there. Uh, we'll go back to you, for example. That's how I found out about you. Yeah. Um, when you were on stage going up against Kamala Harris and absolutely eviscerated her, mm. overnight, everybody knew your name. Tulsi Gabbard, Tulsi Gabbard, Tulsi Gabbard. And you were the one who essentially got her to drop out of the presidential race. Yeah. That's what it felt like. Now, I don't know what the real story was behind the scenes. But yeah, that's, you know, that's what, was, what made you famous overnight. What, what was interesting is, and still people I run into all the time, uh, in the airport or wherever, like that's that's usually one of the first things they say is like, you were the one yeah. who took out Kamala. Um, I'll, I'll tell you behind the scenes, some of my friends who are working in some of the, the green rooms or the newsrooms at, um, at that debate, and you know, they have this whole thing after the fact where you go in and you have like the media is all in one room waiting, waiting to talk about this and rehash and everything else. That when that happened, there were people in the, in the green room for CNN and these other things. They were cheering. Mm -hmm. Finally, someone told the truth about Kamala Harris and her horrible record as a prosecutor, as attorney general. And I thought that was interesting that they were also afraid to bring it up themselves, even though it was obvious, uh, and that they were happy to have the truth out there. But, but to, to the debate formats, I, I forget how many debates I participated in, but on average, I had six to eight total minutes of talking in a two hour long debate with 10 people on the stage. Um, you I gotta think, make the most of it. Gotta make the most, yeah. And that, well, that it was enough to point out that she kept people in jail for weed right. forever. And exactly. hid exculpatory evidence and, and enforced the Biden crime bill. And the hypocrisy like, of on, her man. doing that and then going, I think it was Charlemagne's podcast and they asked her if she smoked weed. She started laughing. She's like, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah like yeah. it was a joke. Mm -hmm. Um, Why? Well, just like uh, for the sake of honesty, I'm high right now. Yeah. Just, I'm yeah. just kidding. No. <laughs> Every day, I assume you're on something. I'm on. I'm not on weed though. Right? <laughs> Is it life today? You're no, high it's, on life it's today? that crocodile. High on life. It's like that, that. It's like that life. crocodile stuff that eats your skin. I'm a full-on Florida man. Oh, uh, big fan of that. Yeah. Uh, but, but we're gonna watch a real life transformation yeah. happening here. Oh, we're we'll going through the Florida man videos for the next three hours. Love here. It. Kidding. It's not a three-hour show. <laughs> um, but with you, you made the most out of that eight yeah. minutes. Um, yeah. And to me, I was like, finally, because I lived in California. Mm when she was uh, attorney general there and all that stuff, um, uh, the DA there. And uh, I knew what she had done, yeah. but unless you live there, you don't really know. Mm -hmm. uh, and you're able to hide some of these Well, stories. people in California know. People in California, and it's shocking to me that Gavin Newsom keeps getting elected to stuff. Yeah. But, and, and Kamala before him, because they are the architects of all the horse shit that happened in San Francisco, the stuff that London Breed doubles down on now mm -hmm. and pretends she's part of the solution for, mm -hmm. which is... That's my favorite part of politics right now is her being like, we got to do something about crime. Like, and she's the mayor of San Francisco. What the fuck Francisco. are you talking about? Yeah. yeah. Like you're paying people 85 grand a year to walk around and collect human shit off the ground mm. instead of just like arresting people like we normally do. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think it shows how dangerous some of these politicians are, though, mm. that a guy like Gavin Newsom and yeah. Kamala Harris, <laughs> they can, uh, you know, make their way through. California politics is a whole thing in and of itself. And yeah. I've, I've never lived there, but I've been told how completely corrupt and rigged the system is because of the unions mm. and, and all of these special interests that will get their person into position, uh, you know, the well-being of the people be damned, essentially. Um, but, but, but I think the record of, of Gavin Newsom in California Obviously, he wants to run for president. He wants to be president. Mm -hmm. um, there's going to have to be a lot of people telling the truth so that people don't fall for charisma. And I don't know if you saw that debate he had with DeSantis. I uh, did. It was interesting. I've never seen that's, – that's one of the um, – that debate was almost as bad as, like, Al Gore – versus Admiral Stockdale back in 92. I don't mm, know if you're, you're about my age. When he pulled out so the, the he, hearing aids? Yeah, Admiral Stockdale, he, he had spent six years underground in a Vietnam prison camp, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, I mean, no, no offense, but he was basically retarded at this point. And he just kept saying, oh, uh, I'll have to get back to you on that over and over again. And then again. he finally, oh. mid, uh, mid, no lie, mid-debate, he pulls out his hearing aids uh. and he goes, I'm all done here. I'm all checked out here. Yeah, he's like just some salty old dude at the VA that's had enough. Yeah. I think Phil I mean? Hartman played him on SNL, yeah. which was a perfect uh, yeah. casting yeah. choice. But like, uh, it's it's interesting when you go into a debate 
armed with uh, just the facts, right? Because yes. Newsom's a piece of shit. And, um, you know, whatever you think about DeSantis, he's done a pretty good job in Florida. Yep. I'm sure you can find a complaint about anybody, but yep. just like <clears throat> some of the claims that Newsom makes about the state of California. Mm-hmm. When I say the state, I don't mean the physical state. I mean, like the state that it's in right now. It's like demonstrably untrue, right? You can just yeah. go look that shit up. Yeah. It's, I, you would think in the age of the Internet that where you can just go look stuff up on the Internet, people would lie less, but they've lied more. More. Yeah. And it's in our faces more. And that's something I wanted to, to ask you about today. Yeah. Um, I know you're, you've got a book coming out here on April 30th for Love or Country. Do you get into the debates there and then the, these do. candidates like Newsom and everybody else that's coming down the line? Yeah, the, this book, For Love of Country, the subtitle is Leave the Democrat Party Behind. And I go into my own experiences of having been 21 years old in Hawaii. I was running for state house and my deci- why I decided to join the Democratic Party. Because I, I didn't come from a family um, of like, you know, my dad was a Democrat and his daddy was a Democrat and all of that. My parents are very independent thinkers, raised mm-hmm. us, fourth of five kids. I'm the fourth of five kids, raised us to be independent thinkers. And, and so in the book, I really talk about why I made that decision then, the experiences that I've had now for over the last 20 years uh, as a vice chair of the DNC, as a member of Congress for eight years, as a, as a candidate in a Democratic presidential primary, and really exposing the truth of um, how corrupt this system is and, and how people, these people especially now, and, and the foremost reason why I left the Democratic Party, um, they're motivated by power and willing to destroy anyone and everything, including the Constitution, in order to hold on to that power or get more. And so I go into a lot of different examples of, of exactly what that looks like, how they're doing it, and who is impacted. And it's not just people like in, in working in politics. It's affecting us in, in almost every aspect of our lives, no matter where you live in the country. Mm-hmm. In all your social settings. Yes. Uh, if you go to dinners or, or meetings or you're playing with kids, it, it comes up. Politics yeah. comes up now. It didn't used to. 15 years ago, nobody cared, and you could still you know, break bread with somebody. Now, it Well, it's like your up. uncle, right? Yeah. Like, there was one uncle at Thanksgiving, mm-hmm. and he was like, JFK is a fucking communist. You're like, <laughs> yeah. maybe. I yeah, like, I never met the guy. He's I'm not alive like, to tell me differently. Yeah. It's amusing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It used to be fun, but... Yeah. It's not anymore, yeah. and now it's, it's, it's become a hard so line. Yeah. It, it's a hard line where, uh, you know, people are demonized, abs- mm. actually <clears throat> demonized. If you have a disagreement on, on an issue or you like one candidate or another candidate... You know, families are, are disowning family members. Friends are just like, no, I can't talk to you anymore. That's happened to me. It's happened to so many different people because what? Yeah. Political differences. And, uh, and, and really, to me, what it comes down to, and this is both the problem and where I see the solution as we head into this next election, which is the most critical of my entire life, where, where our ability to live in a free country is on the line. Nothing less than that is what's at stake. And so the problem is we have far too many people in power, both in government and outside of government, both elected and unelected bureaucrats who only care about power and they don't care about our constitutional republic, our actual foundation as a country. Too many Americans have gotten sucked into this hyperpartisan divisiveness um, that, that, that many people have forgotten who we are as Americans first and what we stand for, what this country stands for. So to be in a position now where, where it's an open point of discussion, like, I don't know, maybe we shouldn't have freedom of speech in this country mm-hmm. because of hate speech and disinformation. And, you know, you go down the laundry list of excuses that, that's being used to censor people. The fact that that is, is an actual point of conversation in many circles points to the deep problem that we have and also the solution where if, if we come together around those fundamental values of freedom and get out and vote, throw out the people who are abusing their power and put people in in both parties who at a minimum are committed to upholding the Constitution. That is how we begin the process to get back on track. And with you personally, um, from what I've read, and and correct me if I'm wrong here, your father's not real amped 
uh, that you're Republican and has made some <laughs> statements recently saying, I don't know what's going on over there, and I have no idea what's happening in that party. You, you've obviously don't hacked into our family it. chat. Have I? <laughs> no. Did I do that? No, no, no. The, sorry. the group chat. What is yeah, it? What, what's, your, what's your family chat? Well, it's group on chat, Signal, like? so you, know, you probably weren't able it's to It's White that, Lotus, but, season know. one. Yeah. yeah, that's your group chat no, over there. No, my dad and I are best friends, and like he, I didn't even know that he talked to USA Today for this article, but he sent me the article. He's like, they took me way out of context. Context. I recorded the whole thing. They screwed up. My dad's a state senator in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. He is the chair of the uh, agriculture committee, loves and supports me in everything I do as I do uh, him. But I, I don't know what question they asked him. It was probably about, you know, VP this or this or that or whatever. And he gave them an honest answer, which is like, I'm really busy right now. We're in the middle of our legislative session. I don't know the details of what's going on. Something along those lines. Okay. Uh, so there's no there's no problems in the in the home. <laughs> Just making sure. <laughs> no, I'm know? glad. I'm glad. To, I'm glad we cleared it up. I I know that when he read that, and that's why he texted me right away. He's just like, I, I know he. I mean, he's sensitive. He, he wants to make sure that, that I know that he loves me and, and all of that. Sure, but on the flip side of this, uh, yeah. I think it, the question came because it is also rumored, like I said at the top of the show, that yeah. you might be uh, on the short list for former President Donald John Trump to be his VP. Is it John? It is John. Oh, yeah. it's James. Well, you're not going to get that job now, Tulsi. <laughs> Jeez, My edit bad. that out, dude. <laughs> Don't let him see it. Don't let him see it. Don't let him say it. Uh, I but, thought it was Jamal. <laughs> it'd be great if it you may was. may change it to that, yeah, you know. You should. Uh, get, he'd really get, get that black folk. Get some street cred. Yeah. Sure would. Um, is that something you would even consider or have considered? Did you even uh, hear that interview on, on Fox when they asked him that question? Your name was in there? I was sitting on, on the couch at my friend's house in D.C. Uh, when that town hall um, happened. And I had gotten, I think it was my sister or someone else had sent me a clip of it. So... Um, that was the first time that, that I, that I saw or heard such an interaction. Uh, of course, of course I'd consider it. I, I think, um, you know, the most important thing for me in my life, whatever position I may be in, in office, out of office is doing my best to be able to serve our country. And our country is in a state of existential crisis right now. And uh, both with domestic issues as well as foreign policy, um, to be in a position where I could actually help support President Trump in executing his policies to secure our border, mm. to bring inflation under control, <laughs> to improve our economy, to support small businesses, to, to stop us from continuing down this path that President Biden's taken us on, where we have, we, we have multiple uh, fires around the world that are pushing us closer and closer to the brink of you know, war, World War III, nuclear catastrophe, um, you know, th those are things that I, I would be honored to be in a position to actually help solve these problems and, and get us back to where we need to be. Do you think uh, voting for Republicans is the way to solve that? Because I don't think I agree with that, frankly. I think that, well, he, it's not I think. I know that the Democratic Party, uh, President Biden, President Harris, you know, there's a lot of questions. Oh, is, is there someone going to be switched out? Mm. It doesn't really matter. Uh, whether it's President Biden or someone else, uh, because we've seen how the Democrat elite across the board are intent on uh, holding on to power and willing to destroy our country in the process. So, you know, whoever people want to vote for, they can vote for, but understand and know that to be true. And there are so many pieces of evidence um, that prove that. I'm not saying, you know, there are problems in the Republican Party mm -hmm. as well. Uh, you know, we look at you look at the uniparty in Washington, the uniparty in Washington made up of both Democrats and Republicans are eager to go to war. You look at this whole TikTok bill that was just fast tracked through the House and is sitting before the Senate. That's a that was a huge majority vote between Democrats and Republicans mm -hmm. in the House. And it is a fundamentally anti freedom bill. Something mm -hmm. Ron Paul recently said was mostly agreed, the most egregious attack on civil liberties and freedom since the Patriot Act on 9-11. So, so this is not to say, you know, one party evil, one party good. It is, it, is, it is a statement of fact that the party in power in the White House is destroying our mm. country and our freedom. And at a minimum, we got to stop the bleeding and begin to start to rebuild by electing the right people in office in both parties.
Yeah, I agree because, uh, you know, Dan and I have, have talked about this um, ad nauseum here on this show uh, as far as let's just take uh, the wars uh, yes. are concerned. Um, it seems like both parties are pushing in for this uh, on each side. And yeah. this funding for Ukraine mm -hmm. uh, and Israel and, and Hamas. Mm -hmm. uh, did you like that, that flair that I was, put on the end of it? Thank very, you. Um, it seemed accurate. Yeah, it's almost like I'm on the ground over there. Um, but, but with that, um, why is the question? Because they all want to line their pockets at the end of the yes. day? Yeah. It's that simple, right? Yeah. Why, why, why even think about it any farther yeah. than that? Uh, it's, it's, well, which is why, you know, uh, I, I don't think that the average American's problems get solved in Washington, D.C. I think that's an insane belief. And it also gives entirely too much power to people who are, weren't meant to have it in the first place. I right. Agree. We are a federalist system of government. Yes. Which is to say the federal government has a very short enumerated set of powers and then that's it. Yes. But that's not how we operate anymore. No. Right. And that's a bipartisan problem. It is. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, you know, you give somebody power, they're not giving it up. Yep. That's a problem. Yep. Unfortunately. Yeah. And I don't think voting is going to undo that particular problem. Um, there are too many people though that are, <clears throat> they see the log jam or whatever you want to call it, or the unit party and become fatalistic or hopeless and think that somehow political violence or something is going to is, is inevitable i don't think that's true at all i think people just being responsible for their own lives probably helps a little bit yeah uh, and then saying no to the government right there's two very concrete examples of the collective power of no that have happened over the last couple of years the first is uh covid and the restrictions the lockdowns the forced vaccination all that horse shit um people capitulated to it yeah. and the government ran roughshod over the country and fucked us up added what, 15 trillion or so probably to the debt, mm -hmm. um, created 40 year high inflation. And then there was a second version called the government governance disinformation board yes. under DHS. And everybody was like, fuck that. We're not doing that. And it went away within three quickly. months. Right. Yes. Yeah. Like very, very quickly. for DC terms, it went away very quickly. Um, you and know. I think that the Missouri versus Biden court case, mm -hmm. which Bobby Kennedy is, yeah. is party to, uh, was another good <clears throat> example of, of how the checks and balances in our system are supposed to work, yeah. where a judge actually had the, the courage and audacity to say, no, President Biden, you and your people will not coordinate with these big tech companies to decide whose voices are censored and whose are not. And that week that they announced that, mm. that, that court hearing uh, or that, that ruling, um, the White House actually had to cancel meetings with Meta and Google that they had planned specifically to determine how they were going to stop, quote unquote, disinformation in the 2024 election. Yeah, and they fired that lady and now she works for the British government. Is that right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, she's the one covering up for Kate. <laughs> she's covering up Kate Middleton. She probably is, yeah. Where's Kate? It all goes back to the kingdom. It sure does. It <laughs> all monarchy. ends up in the crown, doesn't it? <laughs> At the end of the day. We need to throw these people back in the harbor. Yeah, get our tea back is what we need to do. Um, about three or four weeks ago, you were uh, down there doing a fundraiser in Mar-a-Lago. Yeah. Uh, for it was a fundraiser. This is this is kind of it was a, it was an amusing experience for me. Uh, the organization is called the Nine Seventeen Society. It's a nonprofit started by this um, this woman who, on her own, uh, understood and saw the problem that our kids going to school are not learning about the Constitution. She's like, I want to do something about this. So she made it her goal, starting with a very small group of schools, to get pocket-sized constitutions in the hands of every eighth grader. Mm -hmm. And she's been, been at this a few years now uh, and has expanded now to last year, they got uh, a million constitutions into eighth graders' hands in different states across the country. Oh, wow. And this year, their goal is to hit two million. So I, I learned about them a couple of years ago. I wanted to get out to one of their events. I'm not able to make it happen. This year, um, it happened. And I was, I was, and I was, and am very proud to support their cause and their mission. Um, the funny thing that I didn't expect was, you know, I, I said yes to do this event. I don't know, end of last year, early this year. It was held a few weeks ago, and it was at Mar-a-Lago. Mm -hmm. And and I started getting all kinds of messages from people. Um, there is just an assumption that if you're doing something at Mar-a-Lago, it is with President Trump. Yeah, and I, they're look. like, hey. How do I, you know, can you comp me a seat at this thing? And I was like, well, it's not my event. The seats are $1,500. It's a fundraiser. Uh, so, no, I can't. Like, well, I want to see you and our president. And all that. Anyway, it was, it was just funny. I was like, look, he's not on the program. Maybe he drops by. Maybe he doesn't. It, it, the event was held the night of the State of the Union. Uh, so he did not drop by. He was in a room next door doing his live truth tweeting 
mm-hmm. uh, during Truth the Social. State of, Truth Social um, during the State of the Union. Anyway, it was a phenomenal event, and we had people from all over the country. Uh, some of them were big donors to this nonprofit. Others were people who are who are in Broward County in Florida, which is not a, a conservative or Republican county at all. Um, there was a woman who was there with her family. They went and and got these constitutions to the hands of every eighth grade uh, public school class in Broward County, which is really awesome. I think this is really important. But you know what the speculation was? The speculation was Tulsi is going to meet with Trump, yeah. and they're discussing VP options, and yeah. then they're going to couch it as this fundraising yeah. event <laughs> with air quotes, yeah. and that you guys had some secret conversation yeah. about when you guys would announce and all that other stuff. Yeah, no. So. For the record, didn't you didn't talk didn't to him happen. at all? I didn't see him on that trip. Really? No. So you, you just happened to be at his house, essentially, and then yeah. you didn't talk to him <laughs> yeah. at all? No. I mean, it's a, pretty big, no. it's a pretty big place. It's not a court Although, to a judge in New York. Yeah, it's, it's only 18 million, yeah. dude. Right. It's only 18 million. <laughs> yeah. So, you know. Yeah. Uh, so, all right. So, no conversation. You no. get out of there. All the headlines the next day uh, yeah. said this exact phrase, Tulsi Gabbard goes full MAGA. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which sounds like an action film in, yeah. like, the late 80s. I don't need, like, what is that? How do you define full MAGA? I, I think it's probably defined differently by different people, but ultra, I, I yeah. was laughing. There was I saw ultra these MAGA for a while ultra, too. There's ultra headlines. Yeah, yeah. yeah there's co- there's a color system. I, I think Marjorie Taylor Greene's outfit during the State of the Union would would classify or qualify as full MAGA. Oh, for sure. She's been on this show. Yeah, I saw yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's been on she's been on here. Yeah. Uh, not as crazy as you think in real life, by no. the way. No. Um, most of these people aren't. Um, so with that, you didn't meet. You didn't discuss politics, presidency, vice presidency, yeah. anything else. But now you're lumped in with the MAGA crowd, and it's Tulsi Gabbard's a hardcore Republican. I mean, it kind of feels like page six, doesn't it? It does. <laughs> right. Like, none of that shit's it ever does. true. Here, here's the cool thing that, that um, it, first of all, every event that I've ever gone to that, that has had Trump supporters, and there were a lot of Trump supporters there in the crowd that night, I think they were probably hoping to be able to meet him as well. Mm-hmm. Um, they are people who, in my experience, have been... Uh, kind and um, welcoming and people who love our country, Yeah. period. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I'll take this all the way back to, I think it was like the middle of 2022. Um, I got a call from my friend Christy Nome who said, hey, uh, the, the organizers of CPAC wanted to invite you to come and deliver a keynote speech at CPAC at their big annual thing in D.C. And I was like, hmm, that's interesting. Um, yeah, of course, I'll go and talk to anybody. And uh, when I was backstage about to go out and deliver this speech, it was during their big Reagan dinner, Matt and Mercedes Schlapp, who run that organization, they were like, well, we have no idea how our crowd is going to respond to you. So we are going to physically walk you out, one on each side of me, because we just, like, I don't know. People, I was like, what, are you going to throw, like, rotten tomatoes at me or something? Yeah. And they are like, Maybe. It could happen <laughs> what, what was with this crowd, but it was cool because they did walk me out. I got a, a huge and resounding warm welcome from that crowd. I was still a Democrat at the time. I hadn't yet left the Democratic Party. And I gave a speech about freedom and the thing that I care about most. And after that speech, I stuck around to, to meet people. And um, it, was, it was very moving, the kinds of response and comments that I got back from them. Uh, it was just about how refreshing it was mm. to... To hear from somebody who probably isn't and, and hasn't been in the circles that they run in and to recognize, hey, there are actually a lot of Americans in this country from across the political spectrum who share that same fundamental love of country and, and who cherish freedom and peace and prosperity. And, uh, and so that's where, you know, the fact that President Biden has chosen to use the, the term the MAGA Republicans and and the speeches he's given basically labeling the quote unquote MAGA Republicans as the biggest threat to our democracy in the country. Um, it's not only, I mean, I know why they're doing it mm-hmm. to foment fear, but nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, in my experience with people that I've met who are, who consider themselves the MAGA Republicans or the ultra MAGA Trump supporters. Um, they're people who, who really do love our country and who have, taken up this cause because they are so concerned about the attacks on who we are as a country. Yeah. And uh, by the way, same experience. Um, in 2016, when, when Trump was running and everything else, uh, they gave us full access to all the campaigns, uh, Republican, Democrat, even the independents. That's great. Um, and we had uh, most of them on the show 
got to meet Trump, his entire family, everything else. The crowds there um, were just so overwhelming, and it felt like a party and a gathering and a get together. It felt like a really sweet Ren Fair, mm. uh, is what it felt. We were just yeah. like, okay, cool. Same exact experience with all of these people here. They're not crazy like the media makes yeah. them out to be. Uh, they do care about the country. Um, and because you care about the country and you don't want, you know, uh, two million immigrants coming over the border yeah. uh, every per, single month. Per year. Per year. Uh, yeah. Let's get exactly. that it feels right. like monthly. Yeah. It feels like monthly at this point. But they're saying for this year, and I don't have all the numbers at my fingertips, but they're saying for this year, they're anticipating it will be up to eight or nine or 10 million people. We'll see, right? I mean, it's hard to say. Uh, the The previous years, they've gone somewhere between two and two eight. Yeah. So far. Um, that's the... That's the people we've encountered. We don't know about the and getaways. And I think that's the stuff. that's the hard the hard to quantify yeah. is, is how many getaways yeah. but, there are. But the, we, we we estimate something like twenty five million total illegals in the country right now, give or take. Which is, you know, that's what seven percent of the popula- population here yeah. are illegal immigrants. That's weird. Right? Yeah. I mean, it feels a lot like Rome, mm-hmm. and uh, the reason the city eventually failed. Um, I'm going to uh, I'm going to the border next week uh, in California. And I have a friend of mine who who's a veteran of the Marine Corps, uh, who just who, who sent me a text last week just saying, "Hey, there's a huge untold story of what's going on at the California border, um, and that the situation there is far more worse and more extreme than the stories that are being told about what's happening in Texas." Yeah, I mean, a lot of the stories that are being told don't include the fact that if you're an unaccompanied woman or female child. Um, you get sent to a stash house for about two weeks or so, and then you get gang raped and fed drugs, and then they push you out to some place or another, right? right. That's pretty routine. And we, I've been talking about this for a couple of years now because I've got buddies that work down there. Um, the U.S. government has been complicit in it. NBM Inc., mm-hmm. Southwest Key Programs. There's a lot of NGOs that are getting paid millions and millions of dollars to traffic children around the country exactly. right now, right? Um, and I haven't seen one Republican do a goddamn thing to stop it, not one. I don't even see him talking about it. Like this is pub. This information is available now, right? These people have been caught doing these uh, middle of the night transports of illegal immigrants all over our country, including unaccompanied children. And not one motherfucker in D.C. has done a goddamn thing about it. Not one. Not nobody's even tried to do anything about well, it. Well, let me ask you about that. Do you think it goes back to what Trump said back in 2016? Because he got killed for this in the press, where he said uh, there's murders, rapists coming across the border, and everything else. Are people afraid to say anything because they're going to be lumped into that same category and how the media is going to paint them? Um, because that's what I can't figure out either, is they, the Republicans haven't brought it up either. Uh, Democrats, you know why they want to hide California. Obviously, mm-hmm. Newsom's running and everything else. And nope, Democratic Party's great, and we got to get Biden in for another four years, and then I'll be after him. So we're all good here. No need to say anything at the border of California. Um, but is that it? And then what's the solution for it, in your opinion? Yeah, I, I think there are there is um, there are too many Democrats and, and politicians in general from both parties who are making their decisions uh, driven by fear rather than by recognition that, that we actually have to do something and take action to solve this. Uh, on the Democrat side, you know, they're they're under the control of this this kind of woke cabal and, and those who don't fall in line with their woke agenda um, they they face a lot of the treatment that I got, a lot of the treatment that Bobby Kennedy got, which is just an attempt to cancel you and smear you and completely destroy you, your credibility and your reputation. Um, there are common sense minded people there, but they are not willing to speak up for fear of their own political uh, career being destroyed. And then I think it's also just a fact that they see this open mass illegal immigration issue as one that potentially works to their favor uh, in their in their political outlook. You know, we've got the next census coming up in whatever, six or so years now, and mm-hmm. they would like to see some of these states uh, completely in districts redrawn, given this new dynamic of having millions of illegal immigrants now in our country. But do you think they would vote Democrat? Because Dan and I have always said uh, for the last three or four years, more and more Latino voters are going over to the Republican yes. side. Um, because they just came from uh, either a regime or, or some type of uh, gang influence in whatever country they came from. Well, these from. people aren't going to be voting. Like The more direct threat right now is, is uh, the next time a census happens, right? So a census happens, uh, 
everyone gets counted whether they're a citizen or not, right? Mm -hmm. And then you get reassigned new or more districts based on that. So when you do California in the last census in 2020 lost a, a congressional district because people are fleeing that state rapidly. Now the opposite can happen too. And notice uh, th this is, this is okay. why I, I believe that the government is shipping them all over the country to major cities instead of just leaving them at the border. Because you put them in, in more major cities, population density goes up, you get an extra uh, 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 congressional district in Philadelphia, for example, yeah. right? Or Boston or whatever. New York LA, is a critical York, one, yeah. too. Yep. They, they, so wherever, right? Democrats lost seats mm. in New York in this last election yeah. as well. There's a lot in New York yeah, So right it's, not, it's not just about the voter themselves. It's, uh, a lot of it is just a numbers game, I guess. Um, and and some of yeah. some of uh, there there was a congresswoman from New York who who said that out loud. She's saying, "Hey, uh, some people are saying there's quote unquote no room at the inn." She said, "Come to my district. We welcome you. I need you for redistricting purposes." Mm -hmm. She said what a lot of them don't have the courage to say out loud. Well, she said That's the quiet part about. out loud. Yeah, which is, exactly. Uh, which is interesting to hear. Yep. Um, what I think the I think the other issue I think it's important to bring up when we talk about the border is something that we've known has been happening for a very long time, which is you have members of different Islamist terrorist organizations coming across the mm -hmm. border. Yeah, um, Hezbollah guy was caught what, uh, Monday. Wait, yep. today's Tuesday. It was Sunday. Yeah, across with the a border. pipe bomb, and yeah. uh, he was heading to New York City. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, FBI director, I think last week, talked about how they're concerned about ISIS-connected human trafficking happening. Well, so, maybe they should have paid attention to, to that exactly. instead of Catholic moms. Exactly. Exactly. You know? And that's that that that's, you know, points to the serious national security threat that they are creating by allowing this to. But this is what on. happens. This is why federalism has worked for so long, because decentralization fixes that particular yeah. problem. It prevents the centralization and amassing of power uh, in, in, in one place. So I don't think the federal government should even exist. I know I'm kind of a radical on that. I think it's pointless. But. I want to hear your thoughts on, like, if, if Vivek Ramaswamy, who's, uh, I know you guys are friends, has said some, he, he's on the Javier Malay side. Mm -hmm. Like, let's start getting rid of the ATF and the FBI and so on. And I, I agree with him. I think they're fucking dysfunctional organizations. And anybody uh, that, anybody that has the attitude or the predilection to try to control other people is a problem. Yes. Right? That person has to be rooted out of any kind of position of power. Yes. Uh, in any way that we can. So I, I want to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, no, I, I think <clears throat> that um, uh, I agree with the need to to get back to what our founders intended in having uh, localized control, essentially mm -hmm. localized control, and, and remembering and going back to uh, the reason for our Constitution was to ensure that uh, it pointed out the limitations of what our federal government should be concerned with. Um, I, I think that it, it is necessary and healthy for us as a country to have a lot of these conversations and debates that people in Washington are unwilling to have around things like, for example, the Department of Education. Mm -hmm. what, what is the purpose of the Federal Department of Education? They are dictating things that are impacting people at, at the local school level. One example that I, I learned about when I first ran for Congress in 2012 was Hawaii obviously is very connected with and rooted in Native Hawaiian culture. It's a part of everyday life for, for everyone. Well, there was um, a woman there who was teaching, you know, in an elementary, public, at public elementary school, she was teaching, you know, kids how to sing Hawaiian songs mm -hmm. and Hawaiian music and Hawaiian culture. Well, after some federal legislation passed, she got fired because this auntie who was, you know, probably in her late 50s, who spoke fluent native Hawaiian, well, she didn't have a master's degree or she didn't have a bachelor's degree, but you can't, you can't send a, you know, someone who's 20 years old to go to school and, and learn the richness of native Hawaiian culture that she has had from her life. And, and those, those little examples that impact specifically local schools in Hawaii, that'll be very different in other parts of the country. The federal government is, um, intervening in and, and going to a place where they have no business. What to speak of at the broader level where we have uh, essentially across the country over half of people are graduating from school functionally illiterate from our education system. It's called social promotion. So if too many kids from certain areas um, aren't educationally suited to get promoted to the next grade, they do it socially because they don't want 
a 16 year old in fourth grade basically yes. even though they read at a third grade level yes it's social promotion it's evil nonsense it, it's actually from bush it's from the leave no child behind act is where that came from just like generations of incompetence now yeah because i'm from georgia and uh, if somebody taught me how to eat peaches growing up uh, my teacher did, and they weren't from there. I would mm -hmm. tell them, you get the hell out of my state. <laughs> you get out of here. I know how to how eat a goddamn. How dare you? Well, that's how you know when, they, when people say uh, diversity is our strength, they're full of shit, right? Because yep. anytime anybody tries to actually be diverse in a real way, mm -hmm. they shut that shit down. That's what yeah. public education is all about. It's yes. about shaping uh, factory workers, right? It's Henry Ford's model and Rockefeller's model. Like, we want compliant workers. Yes. Um, fuck that. Yeah. And I agree with you here, because why is that at a federal level when uh, locally, yeah, you can't teach these uh, things that go on in, in people's cultures? Right. Um, I, I mean, and just like, you know, you, you can't you can't go and change education policy uh, as a parent or as a concerned member of the community uh, by by going to your local board of education and having them basically say, well, hey, look, these are federal mandates. We can't do anything about them. Mm -hmm. Period. Done. Well, they can, though. Right. The, the way to do it is to reject federal money because the federal yes, government only correct. has power. If you have your hand out, exactly. fuck those guys, right? Exactly. Um, that, so, that's the way to, to deal with it, right? Is to start uh, getting involved with programs like Tim Kennedy's Apogee program, yes. for example, and teach your own kids and let yep. those assholes mind their own business. So my parents, uh, you know, they, they saw this problem way, I don't know, a long time ago, and they made the decision, uh, to, there's five kids, they homeschooled all of us specifically for this reason is they, they were not willing to seed our upbringing and, and you know, the, the instilling of, of certain values in our education to some random stranger in a school. There was a lot less resources available at that time, and I give them so much credit for making that decision at a time when it wasn't popular. But it's more of that, more of encouraging and providing uh, uh, different kinds of support to parents to be able to make that decision best for what's best for their kids. So if you did get in there, let's say you were Trump's VP, uh, and he said, hey, I want to shut this down, I want to shut down uh, DOJ, I want to shut down teachers, you know, the education department, all that other stuff. Uh, you would be in support of that. I FBI, think, CIA. I, I think that within every one, I can't think of a single federal agency or department or institution right now who uh, is, is, is living up to fulfilling its constitutional role. And so I think every federal agency is ripe for challenging whether or not it, its existence is validated, or validated uh, in being able to serve the best interest of, of our country and meeting its, the federal government's role in, in our constitution. And I think we've got to do that and question everything in every federal agency. What about like, um, we, we found out last week there's some leaked documents that the CIA had a couple of hundred people uh, at January 6th, hmm. right? CIA's mandate is foreign and not domestic. Correct. As a matter of fact, they're, they're legally required to operate through a domestic agency to do anything stateside, but yet they were doing it anyways. We also know there were 180, I believe, federal agents in addition to that uh, in the crowd out there. What are your thoughts on all that? Because that seems kind of fucking weird to me, to be honest. I, like the, I mean, the whole thing is weird. But weird. The whole yeah. thing's weird, but that part in particular is pretty weird. Yeah. <clears throat> and, and that's not the only thing. I think there was another report that came out showing that our intel agencies got other foreign countries' intel agencies to spy on President Trump or surveil President Trump or his supporters. Uh, yeah, that's not new, though, right? It's not new. But, but the point is there are so many different examples of how they have uh, egregiously and increasingly mm. brazenly uh, are using these, these powers that are, are supposed to exist for our national security and turning them against Americans and, and not just like random samplings of Americans across the country, but specifically fitting within this category of those who are either politi direct political opponents of, of the Democrat elite and those in power or those who uh, are challenging them. OK. Uh, yeah. And a lot of that started with Obama in 2015. Once Trump announced that he was going to run. Yes. Um, that steel dossier bullshit like that was funded by the DNC. Yes. Right. I mean, it's like uh, I, I don't I don't know that. The, the FBI has ever been weaponized by the presidency to go after a political rival before. I know that um, 
Uh, Hoover did that on his own quite a bit. Mm-hmm. As a matter of fact, that's a big reason he started the agency in the first place. The, uh, yeah, the, he's the, the goat, dude. Place. He's the biggest piece of shit in American <laughs> history, maybe, right? Which I've he's never the goat under- is spying on people, though. You know? yeah, yeah. And the building is still named after him. Yeah, it's crazy. It's it crazy. is crazy. Um, but I, to that point, um, that persisted well into Trump's presidency, even. It right? did. So the Obama influence over federal agencies persisted that's that again is another thing that's very bizarre to me and right? there are even people who trump appointed within his own cabinet <laughs> uh who who allowed either allowed this to continue mm-hmm. uh, or or frankly just did did nothing about it and this is where i think it's essential should he be should he be reelected? that he chooses people uh, to, to serve in these leadership positions, not only those at the very top, but the thousands of political appointees that he has the responsibility to appoint be people of courage mm-hmm. who are not going there and looking for their next political job in order to actually truly execute um, the, the cleaning house that needs to occur uh, across all agencies. Because as you know well, it's the middle managers and a lot of these bureaucracies who their whole philosophy is like, hey, we know we're the ones with the power. We're no, we know we're the ones that actually make things happen. Voters, yeah, you know, they'll pick someone. They'll stay there maybe four years, maybe eight years. We will outlast them all, and we will do everything we can to block the policies we don't like and enact our own mission or vision or, or whatever. And a lot of this came, I mean, a lot of this was exposed um, during Trump's presidency. Mm-hmm. People like, uh, you know, Alan Vindman and others who in congressional testimony said, well, I don't remember the actual uh, the actual quote, but essentially saying that well, we were trying to protect the country from the president mm-hmm. and what he was trying to do, which is such an incredibly dangerous mindset when you look at how our su- system is supposed to work. But that's what government does, though, right? I mean, it eventually becomes such, and it and it's uh, it, it becomes patrician or aristocratic, and um, eventually the attitude turns from servicing. The community to uh, thinking for them, right? Mm-hmm. Like it's it becomes a nanny state eventually, and telling people what they can and can't do for their own sake, yeah. which is uh, you know, I can figure. I mean, I, I don't have thirty four trillion dollars in debt, so I don't want to hear anything from the fucking federal government, yeah. frankly, until they can figure that out. I haven't lost multiple wars. I haven't completely fucked my foreign policy for the last hundred years. So maybe you guys do your thing and shut the fuck up, right? Yeah, because. Like it's anytime anybody who appeals any anybody in this current political generation that appeals to their foreign policy experience, I'm like, all right, cool. Let's look at these uh, box scores right quick. Mm. Let's looks check like the you, examples. Looks yeah. like you lost everything. Yeah, you fucking incompetent turd. Right. Uh, and when Eric was on the show, Eric Trump um, last year, I had asked him. I said, what would what would your father do differently if he were to get reelected? Mm. Uh, and he goes, look, I think he was naive in the fact that all these people were going to work with him Mm -hmm. that were under him right and this next go round will be a lot different where you know and i told him this i said look it felt like everybody was out for a book deal they were in and out in a couple weeks try to get whatever they could record whatever they could get out of there sign a huge book deal and then make a career in something yeah Uh, like an adam kingsinger on uh, on cnn or something like that where you're like all right i gotta parlay this into something (laughs) um and i think uh scaramucci he's one he's one uh, oh he's he's been very outspoken lately yeah i told him he walked off the show i think i called him a cunt um (laughs) i don't remember i mean i call people i'm sure he probably remembers yeah yeah yeah, he's a little he's a little fella he's a little fiery guy he's a tiny man but uh yeah he wasn't he wasn't uh thrilled his was over the vaccine is what he walked out oh yeah he said we were agents of china because we weren't forcing our employees to get vaccinated i'm like All right, really? cool, yeah we just wow. said look i don't we're i don't even think uh you guys are technically employees i just pay you under the table in cash and that's kind of it so. <laughs> i thought they were slaves yeah for like a long keebler time. elves or some you shit did, yeah. like i'm pretty sure the keebler elf thing is a whole slave ring same I, it feels like it doesn't but it? if you dress them up cute it doesn't really feel like and slavery. they're happy so keep they're on drugs yeah, yeah, yeah just keep them sugar no. if you're eating cookies sugar all day, them up. are you really working a day in your life you know you gotta hey. ask yourself that um but I, I it was interesting to hear him say that and i think he's right yeah. i think he will learn from the experience um, of going back in there, I think you know you you have the four years off. You're you're able to study some game tape and then and then try to yeah. figure it out. As far as immigration is concerned, this is what I have personally said on this show, and I'd be curious to hear your thoughts. I think you should shut down the border for ten years. Hmm. Um, it just get a count of everybody who's here, 
who shouldn't be here, get them out. Uh, obviously, you want some people to stay and do some of the jobs that uh, you know the white men won't do, or, yeah. or whatever the the media is going to uh, you know call it. Um, I think a ten year ban. Uh, of just immigration as a whole till we get account of our country would help uh, not, on, not only fin financially, um, but it would help with the budgets and everything else. And then we could actually figure out who's here and then how to help these people if they're going to stay and then who to get out, like you mentioned earlier. I think it was, what, 378 that were on the, the terrorist watch list that yeah. we know that are here. That, yeah, those are the only ones. Those are only the ones we know about. Right. Yeah. So let's get a count. Let's get a head count of everybody. Figure it out. Do another census. Well, luckily um, now a federal judge said that it's okay for them to purchase and own firearms, even if they're illegally here. Right. Which is kind of, that's, that's interesting. They don't believe that for us. No, yeah. no. But um, for them, it's fine. Yeah, it's weird, right? Um, what what, what are your thoughts on so, that? Would, so, would that solve uh, anything? Uh, I'll, I'll disagree, probably meet you halfway. I think that, that all of the efforts and energy, and, and I, I hope that... Well, I, I, I know, based on what he has said, that if President Trump is reelected, this is this is the priority to shut down the border and actually put the resources to securing it mm -hmm. uh, and working with the states and the governors, obviously, as, as the Biden administration has not in actually executing that, using all the tools and technology that we have available and and going through and looking at a, the people who've come across the border over the last three plus years under the Biden Harris administration's open border policy, find them and get them out. Uh, and send a strong message. Anyone enters our country illegally or tries to enter our country illegally, you'll be immediately deported and you will not be allowed back in this country, period, full stop. Um, I don't think we should go so far as shutting down all, all immigration, legal immigration included, um, because I, I think it ends up, it ends up hurting us. Uh, and I, I got a call from a friend of mine who is about to retire as, you know, he's done over 30 years as a Green Beret, um, he wants to invite his, his wife is from Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, he wants to invite his wife's family to come to their retirement. It's kind of a big moment in their lives. On a tourist visa, uh, they have jobs and kids in school and all kinds of things. And they are being told uh, they have been rejected. Mm -hmm. They are not allowed to come to America for two weeks to come to this significant milestone in this man's life who's given his life in service to our country because some bureaucrat was like, yeah, no, I don't think so. Well, we can fix that for you. Yeah. Sneak him in. Eagle no, Pass no, no, is open. No, no, I can just make some phone calls. That's easy enough <laughs> to right. get that fixed. Eagle Pass is open, um. too. I got a buddy down. I'm really good at lifting up barbed wire. Um, you can't see any scratches, can you? No. Yeah, no. not one. You know, one that's of the, how good I am. One at. of the other things about this election that people aren't thinking about right now and um, is the composition of the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. um, because uh, we it hasn't really been made public yet, but behind the scenes... Uh, the DNC is trying to get Sotomayor to retire right now. Mm -hmm. They're 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 really pressuring her to retire, so uh, Biden can put in a new younger, younger person, yep. right, to take that spot because they're really worried about Trump doing exactly what he did last time, which is put three justices on. Right now, Clarence. How Thomas, old is she? Do you know? Uh, Sixty nine. Clarence Thomas it's is probably on his way out for soon. A Supreme Court justice it seems like. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I guess. I mean, it's that, young for that, anybody in politics. Kind of yeah. fucked up. I mean, there's two. There's three in their fifties now. Four mm -hmm. in their fifties, right? Mm -hmm. Kentonji Brown Jackson's yeah. in their 50s. Uh, uh, the party guy, what's his name? Brett Kavanaugh. Yeah. Uh, the, beer, the beer guy. Automatic. Still um, is, dude. The white blonde lady. What's her name? Uh, Amy Coney Barrett. Barrett. Coney yes. Barrett. And then uh, who's the other one? There's one other that's still in their 50s. I don't remember who it is. Uh, but even like... Uh, Gorsuch. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. maybe, uh, maybe it is Gorsuch, yeah. yeah. Uh, but the rest are older. Like Clarence Thomas is in his 70s, right? Yeah. She's 69 now. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I think the composition is going to change pretty soon. And uh, that that's, to me, is something I don't quite understand right now. Like, uh, the fact that they stayed with Biden as the nominee because there's no, like, he's incompetent. I, 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 I'm not that conspiratorial, generally speaking, but I do think Obama has more influence in the White House than Biden does right now. Um, he I had think more, he's president. Obama and Hillary. Both. Yeah, I, I yeah. think he's president. <clears throat> um, but... The fact that they're trotting him out there still as the candidate is very bizarre to me, mm -hmm. considering it could be a, uh, a, 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 a seven to two court pretty soon. Yeah. Like within the next two years, it could be a seven to two court on the conservative side. Not that they always do things that are particularly conservative necessarily, but um, you would think they'd be fighting harder in that particular area, to be honest, because they did last time. That was a big... Uh, 
that was a big political point they made. Huge. It was, yeah. it was the top of the list. In 2016, right? Yeah. It's like, exactly. this guy's a racist. Also, he's going to fuck up the court. Yeah. yeah. Now you don't hear anything about it. I, you know, for, from the Democrat standpoint, for the longest time, they believed that Biden would be the only guy who could beat Trump. Mm. Uh, whatever metrics they were looking at, but also like, hey, he did, well, he was he a did it last time. Whatever, right? Right. He he was he was Uncle Joe, you know. Mm. He he was the guy who got along with everybody, and you know was supposed to be the more, uh, you know, centrist, middle America, mm. moderate, Democrat. moderate, and he it, you know his administration has turned out to be the most radical and extreme, uh, progressive, so-called progressive, whatever that word means to a <laughs> lot of people, uh, administration ever yeah, uh, in weird. history. I, I so I, I think part of it for a while has been that just like hey he did it before he can do it again, but now as we're seeing it break in the media and amongst some influential Democrats who are being very open and saying like hey this guy's not all there he shouldn't be the guy. Mm. Um, Joe Biden is also very stubborn, and you know uh, it, it makes sense that he would believe that he's the guy and and not go willingly. This is something he's wanted his entire mm. life. Yeah. I, I don't see how he. Uh, I don't. I don't see. I, and I, I've known him. I've known him for years. I don't see how he just says, "Okay, I'm going to walk away and let someone else do this." Yeah, and I've changed my stance on that. So I was wrong last year, and I told the audience because I thought for sure he would step down over the holidays and say, "All right, enough is enough." Newsom was there out. There were a lot of signs in the in the public sphere. I think people encouraging that outcome. Newsom was taking trips to China. CNN was talking about potential replacements. Oh, but it it was always Newsom. And Newsom was Mm -hmm. out doing press with everything. And uh, any interview he could get, he was there. So I was like, all right, they're going to slide this guy in. Uh, And then he didn't over the holidays, came back and apologized to the audience and said, well, I got this one wrong. Mm -hmm. Um, But everything that I've heard from the inside was the same thing that you just said, that he's so stubborn that he's one of this his entire life. And if he dies in office... Who gives a shit? That's what he's always wanted to do. So why not just die on stage, I guess? Yeah. Uh, you know, maybe like a Mick Jagger will someday or something. Yeah. Who knows? And, and when you think about it, there are a lot of people because he's clearly not running the mm. show. There are a lot of people behind the curtains who are benefiting greatly from having someone like him in that position where they can very easily be like, hey, here's your note cards. Mm-hmm. There's the cameras. Here's what's going on. And here are the decisions that are being made. And you look at, you know, you talked about President Obama, who, who has said publicly, like, hey, uh, you know, I, I forget what questions, like, do you miss it or whatever? He's like, you know, my ideal day would be me staying at home in my pajamas and running the country from my living room or whatever it was he said, something along those lines. Yeah. And, uh, and then you've got Hillary Clinton saying, she's like, yeah, I talk to the White House every day. And you've got Hillary Clinton's guy, Jake Sullivan, mm. running foreign policy for <laughs> President Biden. And you have uh, President Obama's person, Susan Rice, running domestic policy under President Biden. And so it's not, you know, yes, there are many forces, you know, who, who will remain unnamed, but on a day-to-day practical basis of how decisions are being made and who's in the room, it's not a, at all a stretch to know that it's, it's predominantly President Biden, Hillary Clinton, by proxy or directly, who are, who are calling the shots. Yeah, you mean President Obama? President did I Obama. Say, yeah. What did I you say? said Biden. Oh yeah, Biden, I yeah. meant I mean, President they look Obama. exactly. I like. meant President Obama. Yeah. They look they uh, pretty that, much look alike. That was a mistake, Tulsi. <laughs> you should not have made that mistake. Live on air. Sorry, about it. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This is what like people when they think of the deep that state. That was good. That was good. People when they think of the deep state often think of like. I don't know, a group of, like a cigar smoke yes, filled room. Exactly. A cabal somewhere. It's like, no, it's just assholes on the phone, man. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's not an envelope it's, slid across no, the table to It's Parisian puppets Cafe. in office with, with handlers like Ron Klain, for example, who's been handling Biden for, what, 20 years, something like that. That he, like, it's the unelected bureaucrats are a big problem because they keep, they keep pushing this stuff uh, that I don't think anybody really wants. Certainly people don't want this immigration. I don't, I, I, I don't really get to talk to a lot of uh, so-called progressives because they won't, mm-hmm. right? Because I call them assholes all the time. But um, I, w- I would be really curious to see what they had to say about immigration. I know what the progressive leaders are saying now. It's like, hey, our cities are fucked. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, we told you. Well, I think yeah. this election is going to come down to two issues, immigration and abortion. Um, the economy. And- I think economy and inflation well, you remains... Hope remains near the top of that list. You hope so, right? Yeah. But it used to be the top every year. It used to be every right. year, but then it, it wasn't. Because if you look at your, your receipts and your grocery bills and all that stuff, 
a normal person would say, yeah. this is crazy. It is crazy. Why am I paying $25 for a Five Guys yeah. cheeseburger it's here? Serious. This is nuts. Yep. But I don't hear that from the left. Uh, instead, I hear abortion, abortion, abortion. Yeah. And I don't think the Republicans did themselves any favors by having uh, that dummy from Alabama come up and give uh, an acting speech um, on her first day of class. Like, more classes would have been helpful, just as a former director, I'm saying this. But... Mm -hmm. um, I heard Mitch McConnell made that switch at the last second over Vivek. Is that right? Yeah, well, that's, that's the rumor. That's the word and on the, street. Uh, the word on the street. Uh, and I know some people on the street, Tulsi. <laughs> um, but I, I think he would have been the best one to do that. Now that puts that abortion thing front and center right after the State of the Union. Not great yeah. for Republicans. All the that, ads, that was a huge mistake. All the ads that are coming in right now. Are abortion, abortion, abortion. Yeah. Save your states, save your states. When they should be this, they should these. This is this should be the ad right here. I'm looking at a chart right now, and you'll hear every every Democratic Party messaging center, whatever it happens to be, whether it's a PAC or the media itself or a politician's campaign, are talking about how good the economy is doing yes. right now, and it's doing great if you're wealthy. Yes, right? yeah, exactly. Like yeah, if, you're, if you're rich, if, if your interest is in the S and P, you're doing fine, right? But if it's in putting food on your fucking table, not so much. So, um, here's some. This is from February 2020 until today. Baby wipes are up 50, uh, 55%. Yeah, I got three right? kids. I can confirm that. Um, bleach is up 75%. That's weird. I Coke. thought about drinking it every weekend. That's, mm. that's um, true. Cow milk is up about 20%. Deodorant, uh, 60%. Dog food, 60%. Eggs, 60%. Um, nutrition bars, 80%. Yep. Mm. The ch uh, chalupas are up 300%. Yeah, paper, <laughs> towel, paper towels are up 40%. Potatoes are up... 70% ramen noodles are up 75%, mm. right? The stuff that poor people buy, for example, yeah. right? Yeah. So these people, the leftists don't give a fuck about the poor. They hate the rich. That's all it is. It's all it's ever been. It's like a weird pathology where I don't, I don't know if it's like. The, and yet so many of them qualify as being yeah, quote yeah, unquote yeah. rich. Yeah. yeah. It's so weird, right? And, and, and that's where, yeah, I, I mean, None of them are talking about this, and mm -hmm. I think that they're using the same tactic with the economy as they are with the border in just pushing out like, hey, the economy's great, mm -hmm. and hoping people just believe it if they say it enough. Well, the border's secure, hoping that people will believe it, but this is where I think there's, this is where I hope, and I, you know, I don't have data to back it up, but this is where I hope just, and, and I, I would add this whole thing with, um, you know, Title IX and people's daughters having to compete against boys in sports and, and all this other stuff, that the, these things that impact the everyday lives of the vast majority of Americans across the country mm. that transcend the, the quote unquote politics or traditional differences of Democrats versus Republicans on different issues, these are undeniable facts that, that people are living every day. So it doesn't matter how, how many times they're told, hey, the economy's great. Mm. If they're seeing their paycheck go, you know, uh, not nearly as far as it used to be because of this radical increase in, in inflation. Um, I, I just hope that people pay attention to that. You, you would think the mind has to rebel at some point yes. to being fed yeah. bullshit. And for I that think long, COVID, the think. whole COVID thing, I think helped instigate mm. that in people recognizing that, hey, one plus one, what they're telling us is, does not actually make sense here. I hope so, but I've, and I said this earlier on, on, uh, on Ross Patterson Revolution this morning, but I hope so. The problem is they're doing things right now that are so blatantly obvious lies in front of our yes. face on a daily basis. Um, we'll take these Trump trials that are going on right now. I, I talked about it earlier with Mar-a-Lago. Great. You have a judge that says, you know what? A moonlight is a, is a realtor for Zillow, and that's $18 million. Now you're going to pay $454 million, yeah. or we're going to shut down all your properties. It's currently going on. Nobody can stop it right now. Um, then you have the thing in Georgia. Yeah. Uh, Fannie Willis. Great. She comes on. She's got her lover. Clearly paid seven hundred thousand dollars. He's saying she only got a few hundred bucks back in cash, and vice versa. You know what? You get to stay on the case. Just just fire your ex lover. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's happening every single day in front of our face. That I don't think they care anymore. No, when you, when people operate openly with impunity like that, it's because they believe they are entitled to. Right. Yes. It's like you know. Um, this is why you should never give the government power over anything. I hate this. There's too many. Every fucking bill now is called the bipartisan something, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh, Republicans and Democrats are working together. When Republicans and Democrats work together, America suffers because of it. Because these people are the worst people in the fucking world that think that they have the right 
to hold other people's liberties in their hands and dole it out as they see fit, right? Now, eventually we're going to have to get to this part of the conversation, I think, about your stance on the Second Amendment and how it's evolved over time. I've got some sure. thoughts on it, but I want to, uh, just for the audience, give us the elevator pitch, right? Because it's yeah. our, our audience cares about this stuff. Yeah, so of course. Give you 80% of our audience is military and of first course. responder. Yeah. Um, they're also fans of yours, even when you were a Democrat, said, so, you know what? Wish, wish you would come over to the other well, side. Well, first they were fans of Moana. Moana. And then, first, like, you, you're swimming in her you. wake, to be honest. Yeah, and then you I'll came on it. board. <laughs> but where you lost some of them was on uh, some of your particular stances on, on 2A. Yeah. Um, where do you stand now on that, going back to what Dan said? Um, I support the Second Amendment. Uh, you know, my experience over the last several years in particular uh, gave me a much deeper and greater appreciation for our founders' intent for the Second Amendment. Um, uh, what, do you, what do you mean, your experience? Like, uh, I mean, well, just, just you know, first of all, I, I grew up in Hawaii, which is, the, mm. I think it has the, the, the most restrictive gun laws in the country. Uh, the state legislature is currently trying to push even more restrictive gun laws during this legislative mm. session as we speak. And so my exposure to guns growing up was, I mean, you know, my dad went and we shot a pistol a few times, probably. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was pretty much it. Mm -hmm. First time I ever touched a rifle was when I joined the military in basic training. Um, even in that, even in that atmosphere and environment, it was, you know, as, as you know, it was like, okay, you're going to go sign your, your rifle out of the armory. Um, every single round that you have is accounted for. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it is in, a, in and of itself a pretty restrictive uh, environment. And even at best in the military, a lot of them only shoot a couple times a year, mm -hmm. if, if that. Um, and so in, in concept, I had always supported the Second Amendment. But uh, when talking with different folks, I, I did not fully understand when people are saying, well, these are common sense gun safety laws. And well, maybe this, if you do this thing, it will help to uh, prevent the next sh mass shooting in a school. And I think there are a lot of Americans who, who felt as I did, well, you know, if, if there's a way to strike that right balance where you're able to uh, maintain people's rights to defend themselves and also try to prevent a mass killing, then, then shouldn't we try to do that? Um, the, the argument that was made that I had heard people make about our founders intending the Second Amendment not only to be a right to defend yourself and your loved ones uh, for recreational purposes or whatever, <laughs> uh, but to serve as a check on the power of a tyrannical government, in my mind it was like, okay, that, I, can't, I can't imagine that scenario in my life. Uh, and it didn't seem, it didn't seem, um, it didn't seem real. And that's where over the last several years, we, in my experience at least, we have seen such a transformation where that has become a very real, very real situation where the abuse of power is becoming so brazen. Um, I got to spend a lot of time with folks uh, during my 2020 campaign and since who, who shared their experiences with me, people who've grown up around guns and understanding well, what, is, what is this quote unquote gun culture like and, and what are the... Um, maybe intended consequences for some. I know a lot of Democrats who want to get rid of guns completely, mm -hmm. get rid of the Second Amendment. For some, there are unintended consequences, um, you know, of, of some of these things that are sold as common sense gun safety laws and how they do directly infringe on our Second Amendment rights and how they are essentially these uh, stepping stones toward um, their ultimate goal and objective, which is getting rid of guns and disarming the populace. And uh, so my views on, you know, things like the assault weapons ban have changed uh, out of that learning, understanding and that growth in, in really um, appreciating our founders full intent for the Second Amendment uh, and, and what that means to actually be committed to to supporting and defending it. I think Ben Franklin said uh, anyone that sacrifices liberty for security deserves neither. Right? Yes. Um, it's. I've, I've had this conversation with a lot of people about not just you, but a lot of people have made this, I guess, um, road to Damascus transformation over the last couple of years. It's, it's easy to say it now that you're not voting on it, right? But your voting record says it tells a different story. Now I know people can change things change like that. I guess I'm, I, from my perspective, I'm, <clears throat> it's less about guns 
specifically for me. It's more about the relationships some people have with the Constitution itself, this predilection to uh, uh, think for other people, right? This, the idea that, that anybody has the right to tell somebody else what to do, how to defend themselves, and so on and so forth, um, is much deeper than just the gun issue, right? Because it yeah. manifests itself in quite a few ways. Yeah. Like we, we talk about the Bill of Rights. I, I doubt many people could even list them, frankly that talk about them on a regular basis. Like, I, I don't want troops quartered in my home, but I don't think that's going to be a problem either. Uh, but search and seizure is something that I should be worried about, right? So um, let's say, let's take this uh, to a practical level. You're in office somewhere with a voting power to do so. Um, how would you react to, let's say, the ATF or the NFA, the National Firearms Act, that restricts all sorts of gun ownership? And the fact that the ATF has created a $2 billion uh, entry-long gun registry, which is against federal law, things like that, how would you handle those things specifically? <clears throat> I, think, I think those are two, uh, two of the many examples where um, government abuse of power and gover government overreach uh, has, has become rampant. Um, I'm not going to pretend to be an expert on all of these issues, but I think it calls into question whether or not those two should exist. Well, they shouldn't, right? Like why, it, it, let's say, let me think of a good uh, metaphor here. Um, let's say you're in a village and there's bears surrounding the village and mm -hmm. I give you a tool to use to defend yourself against the bears, but I give the bears a vote and how that tool gets used, right? That's not how that's supposed to go. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I've got I, it's. It's really difficult for me to buy the the because it's now very politically expedient for people to jump on board with a lot of this conservative stuff that people have fought for for a very very long time. Yeah. To be honest. Yeah. No. I I think your your and others' skepticism uh, is warranted. It's warranted. Uh, I think also. If we are to hope to bring about change to our government, to our laws that are currently infringing on our freedoms, there has to be room for people like me mm -hmm. to change, to actually learn. Um, you know, if we are, and, and it's not only this issue, but, but there are many others. If we close ourselves off to saying, well, um, you know, in my case, well, this was a bill that you co-sponsored. This is a vote that mm. you took. I will tell you, no, I would not do that today. Mm. I, I'm, I'm not in a position of, of elected office, so I right. can't show you that. Um, and I don't expect you to just be like, okay, cool, got it. I get it. Trust is earned. Mm. Absolutely. But if, if there is not an openness to having this kind of dialogue and frankly to helping, and I wish people in Congress would go and, and go and hang out with a lot of my friends, a lot of people who I've heard from mm. and I've learned from to be able to gain that understanding. Mike and Tim and people like that. Yeah, yeah. of course. And, and gain that kind of understanding that, that, um, that they clearly don't have and to challenge their assumptions or the things that they, sought, that they thought to be true. We should be encouraging those kinds of things. Um, if we don't, and it's just like, hey, you, you are a Democrat, so you're, like, you're, you're, you're not a part, of, you're not welcome. Mm -hmm. yeah. Then where do we go? How do we grow? How do we actually start to fix things? I, I think yeah, there's I mean, no that's, there's that's no stupid. ability to do that. That's I, stupid. I, I agree, and and you do have to allow people to change because that's what we ultimately want for everyone. Um, you know. Well, otherwise, what, why are you in the argument? Right. If you're not right. willing to hear yep. somebody else, now fuck hearing them. Like if you're not if your goal isn't to change their mind, you don't actually believe what you're saying. You just that's. Just, yeah, that's if you're just, just if you're just right? yelling and and making your argument because you want to hear yourself make it. That, that's really what, and unfortunately, that's what a lot of our, our so-called debate uh, is about, is people are more interested in hearing themselves rather than actually seeking to influence and inform and actually mm -hmm. have a true, meaningful engagement that, frankly, both people benefit from. I know that I have <clears throat> over these years. What are your thoughts on red flag laws? Because a lot of people have, I mean, it, it's an interesting question because if I were to tell you I have this data and if I give it to you, then you can um, prevent something from happening, yeah. right? Like, yeah, that's a fact. Just to say, for the sake of argument, that was a fact. What responsibility do you now have to, to put that into power? Like, yeah, my, I, my position is that the government should never have a say in that, right? Because yeah. they're the thing we're defending against, yeah. frankly, right? But I, And I'll be, I'll be very honest with you and, and your viewers. 
Um, I, I have a lot of concerns about the red flag laws, and, and also this is an area that I wanna, that I wanna learn more about. Um, you know, because I've seen and, and heard the stories about, oh gosh, I forget what state it was in, but um, there was someone that uh, uh, was a friend of a friend who basically had a disagreement with his wife. Mm -hmm. She left the house, called the cops and said, hey, my husband has a bunch of guns and um, I don't feel safe or he's having a mental health breakdown. Mm -hmm. Cops came in, got all the guns, took them away. And uh, I don't remember if they arrested him. I think they may have. Uh, but basically, they kept his guns. And even after he proved, like, hey, I'm not a risk to my wife or my family or myself or others, uh, he had to file a lawsuit to mm -hmm. get his guns back. And I believe, I believe he may have uh, taken this up. I don't know if the Supreme Court. This uh, yeah, I, yeah, I know the case. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I don't know. I don't think it's made it to the Supreme Court okay. yet, but. But I think he was pursuing yeah. trying to trying to continue to challenge that. So anyway, that's 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 the risk. Well, one example of the risks um, that I see. I mean, uh, that's a false that's a false positive in bureaucracy, and a, which and is I'll a risk. It's which is definitely a risk, and that like incompetence is always a risk with government, right? Yeah. I mean, just go to the fucking DMV. Yeah. The 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 real risk is what we've seen over the past, let's call it eight years, which is the weaponization of the federal government against yes. regular ordinary people. Right? Yes. So every rule they make, just imagine it being leveraged against you. Correct. Right? I mean that's that because that's exactly what the fuck's going to happen. Uh, and now uh, we're also dealing with this TikTok bullshit. It looks like the Saudi government's trying to buy it now, which is great for everybody. Dude. Correct. Like we <laughs> should definitely trust the people that did not allow buy it. the PGA and yeah. then the WTA, which is the Tennis Association yeah. as well, and combine that. Um, but I'll go back to what you said uh, regarding 2020. Here was January 6th the part of this change in stance on guns um, because it, for me, it was the first time in the show that uh, the government could actually make yeah. something happen like look into push your everybody in look into your banking records and see if you were in a city and then just go arrest you yeah and correct like yeah all right because before that this, i guess before the january 6th thing i was like ah our government would never do that mm -hmm. um you know i never even me personally dan's got one right next to his desk obviously uh an ar-15 but uh me personally never thought about uh buying one got a couple handguns feel feel safe and secure with those if yep. anything were to happen around my house that was the first time where I was like, oh, shit, man, our government's capable of more than we even know. Yes. Did that have something to do with your change in stance? Yeah, I, I would say it started before then, but uh, that certainly um, showed a, a, a serious escalation of force, actual force, by our federal government against political opponents, and it has increased from there. Um you know, the push by Elizabeth Warren to, to force credit card companies to flag purchases of ammunition mm -hmm. from wherever, Dick's Sporting Goods or wherever, wherever you go, uh, and, and flagged as a quote unquote way to uh, protect us from suspicious activity. Um, you know, the stuff we saw happening in Canada with the truckers, uh, the stuff that we saw happening with the IRS under the Obama administration targeting groups specifically mm. who had patriot, the nonprofits that had mm -hmm. patriot like in Mike their, Lover's, in uh, their title. Like Mike Lover's Survival is technically a terrorist organization. Yeah. They teach people how to make uh, rabbit traps mm -hmm. and, yep. and purify water in the fucking wild. You yep. ever been punched in the face by a rabbit? Uh, no. It hurts. You it's have? Like, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. How Easter. does that work? I mean, the kangaroo thing, I get. Those kangaroos get, Easter get Sunday. real boxy. Easter you just got to keep your distance on the kangaroo, though. He's got yeah. short yeah. arms, right? Yeah. yeah. You can they are muscular, though. Yeah. <laughs> they're jealous. <jacked. laughs> See, the, 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 real, the real threat from a kangaroo is they'll prop up on their tail, and yeah. they kick you with their back. They'll kick the shit uh, out of you okay. with their back legs. That's, that's where you got to watch out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but for me, that's kind of where this all started. Yeah. And, uh, and then, you know, moving forward, let's say you are the VP. Um, do you think we will get an honest and fair election this fall. I don't know. Do you think the last one was? If there's no. any doubt, there is no doubt. Right? Robert De Niro said that one time. Did he? He was right, yeah. It was in uh, Ronan, I believe, was the movie. But it, he's a profound statement. He's yeah. right. If there's any it doubt, is there is no statement. doubt. Like if, you, if there isn't, it's the same thing with our epistemology. If there isn't like an absolute set of facts that we all agree on, then it's not, we're all fucking playing games here. Yeah. It's all nonsense, right? Yeah. I wasn't expecting a, a Ronin reference today. So I'm it's a good movie. It is. The, yeah, the dude still, from, the dude from uh, 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 John, whatever the fuck his name is, that French dude, great actor. 
Sean Bean's in that movie. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's a great movie. All those guys. I haven't seen it in years. Me too. Well, it's from 92, it which was yeah. like... You yeah, were, I, was, I wasn't even born yet. No, 34 years old, <laughs> tender babe in the woods, still am. Um, but but you don't think 2020 was a was a, a real election? Well, um, well, no. I mean, it, it was it was an election, but I think that a lot of people are focusing on the wrong things when they're talking about it being a quote unquote rigged election. Because you got to look at the the influence operations. You mm. got to look at. That's what he's. Yeah, saying. I said that yeah, for that's years. What he said like for you years. don't have to hack a machine, but you can hack somebody's fucking brain. That's right. Yeah. That's exactly right. And you look at you look at uh, how how the parties were trying to uh, tilt the scales. Um, you look at you look at the the freaking ongoing coup that started against President Trump from the time that he was running in 2016. We're talking about the, the quote unquote deep state mm. and what that looks like. That continued on throughout almost his entire presidency in 2016 and is still going on. And and this whole Ru Russia collusion mm. thing was really at the heart of uh, it. Has that ever, I wonder, I, I, maybe somebody knows this, but has it ever happened before that a previous administration just can continue to control the, the office after the old administration was out? I'm sure it's happened. I'm sure it's in happened, some places. but not to this level. Yeah. Because there's never been... Because it was the entire intelligence community. It was. Like, every retired IC guy who was a fucking, uh, uh, like, let's say, uh, out of GS, right? Like, yep. above GS level, was writing letters like, oh, this is real. Like, no, it's not. And then yep. they, they came back a couple years later with the Hunter Biden laptop, like, oh, it's fake. Like, no, it's right. not. Right. Like, how, how e wrong Even do you though they knew. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They yeah. knew when they wrote that letter, when those 51 guys knew that when they wrote that letter that it was it was false. Uh, but but so that that's my point, is that... Uh, it's important that people know the truth about what what is really going on because it will continue. And we're seeing it happening right now with all of the different ways they've been trying to get President Trump mm -hmm. off the ballot. Um, you know, I, I, I know that we will continue to see more of these kinds of effort. And this is where um, I, I tell people as flawed and as problematic as this system is, the only way we get to a place where we can start to fix it is is to engage in the process is to actually vote and make informed votes don't just follow blindly party line the democrats one of their things that i always found uh, just offensive was they would go up on stage over and over again saying vote blue no matter who mm -hmm. like what Vote blue no matter who. I'm sure Republicans would have said it if they could have thought of but, anything clever, right? Well, I, I was asked a couple of weeks ago by, by an influential Republican in, in New York City at a, at a dinner. She's like, are you going to stand with the Republicans? I said, well, which Republicans are you talking about? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, and I told her, I'm not going to stand with Liz Cheney. Right. Uh, I'm not going to stand with Nikki Haley. What about like, that what weirdo from New York? George Santos. Santos. Yeah, he popped back yeah, in, by the way. State of the he Union. He said he's going to run again. Sure did. He and should. He, he should back in. He should run for president. Into yeah. the back row. He was all sassed up. Hello. He was ready to rock there. Um, he has. I think it's what is it in his Instagram bio, or maybe it's his. Um, uh, I don't know. OnlyFans account where he says he's an an iconic. Former member of Congress. Yeah, he's a little Maxinista is what he is. He's a TJ Maxx guy. <laughs> Something. Likes to get all classed up over there. Is that what they call it, Maxinista? <laughs> they do on the streets. Again, I've got people. That uh, classy joint, TJ yeah, Maxx. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> whatever. Hey, hey T I love TJ Maxx. It's about f being fiscally responsible. You, sure, go to you don't have Maxx. a choice but to shop there now. You can't afford <laughs> anything else. Exactly. Uh, in most <laughs> of these major cities, they're shutting down everything else. Yeah, so that's the yeah, only thing that's left. True. There's Ross's Lock too, and key. right? Yeah. Ross's too. Not yep. as Not no no bearing, obviously. Yeah. Uh, now, with your book, For Love of Country, that's, that's coming out April 30th, you can pre-order that now on Amazon. What's something fun and flirty in the book that nobody knows about Tulsi Gabbard? Mm. Fun and flirty. I don't know about the flirty part, but the fun part... Well, wait, uh, I learned your husband's name was Abraham today. He was here, and yeah. I said after Lincoln. Yeah. You guys went biblical. Yeah, he's yeah, out there biblical. parting the Red Seas we right with those Moses. I know. <laughs> Which one was Abraham? We'll he's out there making the, tribes. We'll start with the traffic. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I get into some pretty um, uh, personal parts of my life that I, that I haven't shared and don't really share... Uh, publicly in the political realm because they are personal, but, but I get, get into um, the central um, role that God plays in my life and my own, my own spiritual journey and relationship with God and, and get into some of the experiences that I had um, while I was running for president that um, 
that were so eye-opening um, and, and kind of frankly revealed my naivete when I first started to run for president uh, and exposed the, the toxic underbelly of, of our American politics and how deeply entrenched the corruption and the rot in Washington is uh, in both parties. And it is the uniparty that always tries to, to uh, take away our freedom in the name of them, get, or so that, that they can get more power and very often done, as we're seeing with the TikTok bill, in the name of national security, which goes back to the Ben Franklin mm. quote that you talked about. Yeah, it's always the road to hell is paved with good intentions, yes, right? Yes, it's true. It's um, true. And don't, then, don't believe anybody that, that's coming to sell you a miracle cure. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. It's just and social demand snake truth. oil I, I think this is, this is what we need more of, <clears throat> of from our, our uh, political leaders at every level is tell me the truth, even if you know it's going to piss me off. And, we, you know, politicians very rarely do that be, unless it's about the other guy. <laughs> right. But, but let's say uh, let's take a guy like Dan Crenshaw, for example. Yeah. Um, you guys share uh, a lot of the same friends, military, everything else. We were, we were friends when he got to Congress. So I got to know him a little bit. Um, do you follow? His, do you follow yeah. his stock advice? No. Sure. Well, you'd be top five. He's beating the <laughs> SEP by twenty five percent. So you should. You know, I haven't talked to him for a while, and he hasn't reached out to me. And and um, but but I, I think that his you know he is he has decided to take on the banner of of Ukraine and this proxy war with Russia, and is pretty livid uh, at those who say we shouldn't. And I'm one of those people. Yeah, same. Because it's in the border bill. Yeah. And that's right. everybody's saying, oh, why, why the can't you have the border I'm sorry. The bipartisan border bill, you it's, stupid yeah. bitch. Exactly. That's, yeah. And you that's my fault. You stupid bitch. That's my fault. I'll wear that like Santos today, uh, okay? Speaking of that, what are your thoughts on Russia, uh, like an off-ramp to the situation? Because we had one before it ever started, mm -hmm. right? Had one. Uh, an off-ramp. Like, we yeah. could have shut yeah. that shit yeah, down yeah, before yeah. it ever started. Yeah. Then we had another ceasefire that was agreed to when Boris Johnson showed up and fucked that up. Mm -hmm. So who's going to step in and fuck this next one up? Like, because they're definitely, U Ukraine is fucked, right? They can't fight this war. So Well, they can't win it. Well, fair enough, yeah. yeah. But, like, if you fight long enough without winning, you lose. Sure. So, uh, <laughs> uh what what are you what are your thoughts on how this is going to play out? To be honest, like I, I don't because I don't know. It, I, it definitely depends on who gets elected in this next election. Yes, yes. Uh, I don't know who the intermediary or the, the <clears throat> or the the neutral broker will be, but mm. that is the only way that this happens. And as you pointed out, Turkey attempted. Other countries mm. have attempted to serve as that intermediary for discussions that at different times both countries were actively engaging in. But it was the United States and others in the West who who have stood in the way of that. That's the only way. That is the only way sure, yeah. that this ends. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it'll continue to be a war of attrition, and uh, and more and more innocent people um, will die. I, I'm very concerned about Macron and his increasingly escalatory yeah, he's, statements. He's, he's like he Tony wants Blair. NATO all in. He's like Tony Blair during Iraq now. Yes. That's what he is. He's like the one dickhole in Europe that's just like, yeah, let's split and do this. Right. Like, all right, we'll send some troops there, bud. Right. Yeah. Or you go. France? Yeah. Well, that's <laughs> like, the what problem. the fuck is like, France no, going to do? Don't send your troops there because if, if he sends his mm. troops there, mm. then, you know, it'll be, you know, it'll be hours yeah. before Article 5 in NATO is invoked and then it turns, it turns into World War Three. Yeah, or a bloodbath. Yeah, yeah, bloodbath is another hashtag. one. That's a hot, that's a hashtag bloodbath. <laughs> I was trending. I saw that trending yesterday. It was, and then uh, last but not least, this morning there was a, an op-ed piece about you where they said I think Tulsi would be a great Secretary of State. Interesting. Is that a job that you would consider? Yes, absolutely, okay. absolutely. It the, would be the, good because we have the most incompetent group of cabinet secretaries right now that we ever have had ever. Ever. Yeah. Mayorkas is the worst yes. at oh, that boy. job yeah. uh, that I've ever seen anybody be at a job. Buttigieg took four months of paternity leave while we had international shipping crises. It's like somebody's got somewhere has got to be good at something. Well, right? yeah. Yes. I mean, and, and you can look at, OK, well, there are different people who have different resumes and qualifications or, or whatever the case. The may mayor be. of South Bend. Yeah, yeah. Not, that you should that Mayor shouldn't P. even his, that shouldn't even be on your resume. No. Come on, man. His and it was it was uh, it was interesting because we were both running for president at the same mm. time in 2020. Um, his city in South Bend was the same population as my district when I was on the city council mm. in Honolulu, which I thought was fascinating. And someone during that time did a side by side comparison of headlines around the headlines when I announced my candidacy mm. as a veteran. He is a veteran, served I think in the Navy. 
Pete Buttigieg announces his candidacy, and they did a side by side of all the collection of the headlines, and it was like negative, 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 negative. Maybe one, maybe one slightly positive, and then it was just like puff pieces uh, across the board, which again points to the reality, which is the parties, the mainstream media, and big tech pick and choose who we as voters um, should know about, what we should know about them, and and whether or not they are deemed credible mm. or not. <clears throat> And if you're not part of that cabal, then it's it's you know it's guns a blazing um, against you. But but again, I'm gonna, I'm just going to reiterate this because it is critical. Uh, whether it's as Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, these these positions, you know, the Director of National Intelligence, the head of the CIA, all of these positions need to be filled with people, yes, who are competent, and also just as importantly, maybe even more importantly, have courage. Mm have courage because you're not only taking on the wrath of, of, you know, it, it will be the wrath of members of Congress. It will be the wrath of the media. It will be the wrath of, of the, the wa permanent Washington elite, but it's also the wrath of all those middle managers who will be threatened by having someone in a position of leadership to actually turn every one of those agencies and institutions inside out. Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, now's the point in the show we get to something called the Drinking Bro of the Week, which All right. is someone who has inspired you or helps you become the person you are today. Who would you like to give mm. the Drinking Bro of the Week to? I worked for a time for Senator Akaka from Hawaii. He was uh, a World War II he veteran. Was a World War II veteran. Anyway. And did he fight in Korea as well, or was it just World War II? Uh, it was. It was just World mm. War II. Uh, <laughs> he was a school teacher. Um, all the way up till the time that he ran for Congress. And uh, he was a true statesman. Um, what I learned from him was, and we started the conversation with Aloha, so I'll close with Aloha. Uh, he was somebody who really embodied what Aloha means, which it's, it's used as a greeting, you know, hello and goodbye. Mm -hmm. But the reason why it's used for a greeting is because of the deep meaning um, behind it, which is um, based on a recognition that we're all children of God and that we should treat each other with respect um, because of that. And by starting a conversation with Aloha, you get past all of these other barriers that too often get in the way of having a meaningful engagement. Um, he, he is somebody who um, inspired me because of that spiritual groundedness. Um, and, and early on in my politics, uh, not about one issue or another issue, but just how to, how to walk through life and do your best to live in that way. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, look, uh, can't wait for the book to come out. It is uh, Tulsi Gabbard for Love of Country. It is available now on Amazon for pre-order. All those pre-orders counts for the first week yes. in the New York Times bestseller list. But let's face it, you're a Republican now. You're not getting on there. I'm an independent. Okay. Well, hey. hey. All I've read is your full MAGA. <laughs> That's what I thought the book was going to be called. Yeah. Full MAGA, Tulsi Gabbard, shotguns. Uh, there you yeah. go. Full, full MAGA is actually a first form product. Is it really? I think it's like a, a heart pill of some sort. Yeah. Interesting. Well, get it. Protect yourself. Pretty close. They should yeah. change it. I know Andy likes Trump, so you should put full full MAGA on there probably. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think but, a lot of people would buy it. So if you, if, if you were to get elected as VP, would you be a Republican or an independent then? I don't know. Okay. I don't know the answer to that. I mean, I think it, there, there's probably a practical rules-based answer to that. I don't know what. I don't that know is, that there is. It, you, it, it's the the party decides, right? So the parties are they decide who they nominate, who they don't. As a matter of fact, up until Bob, what when did it change from just the top two vote getters were in office together as oh, uh, P and VP? Uh, I'll double check. It was it was pretty I, quickly. I, in yeah, the, I think it was like the I think it was after uh, uh, John Quincy, if I'm not mistaken, mm. so like sixth or seventh president maybe. And I think, but it used to be like the top two vote getters would be right president, Eight, and vice president. Uh, right? 1804. Hmm. So oh, it so it was like it was after Adams it. then? Yeah, yeah, it was Jefferson. Okay. And then I think in '86, uh, the BC Boys said you have to fight for your right to party. And then the Mets. Yep. Won the World Series against the Red Sox. They sure did. Yeah. Sure did. And that changed a lot of things for everybody. Changed a lot for Mookie Wilson. Sure did. Uh, we appreciate you being on Thank the you. show today. Um, and I'm with you, by the mm -hmm. way. I think people should have the right to, to change, and hopefully you learn and, and everything else. And we'll see if, if it comes to good use, hopefully here in the future. Um, there's a lot of people out there that are rooting for you. And, uh, and it's, it's super interesting. Uh, I don't know who he's going to pick. I would imagine the decision is, is going to come soon. 
And if, you, if you're down at Mar-a-Lago, obviously, I'm going to speculate and just say you're, you're meeting with them. Okay. Yeah, yeah, as soon as you leave here, you're we're going to tell everybody else. you told us that you're the VP. So. <laughs> yeah, so sorry about it. Tomorrow's show, we'll tell you everything behind the scenes. Kidding. <laughs> Thank uh, you guys so but much. But buy the book, For the Love of Country. You can pre-order it now. It'll be shipped to your house and on your doorstep on April 30th. That's right. Uh, go to iTunes, rate the show a five star, and leave a quick review. Also, head on over to Spotify. It's just a five star, and you can walk away. For D'Anthony, D'Anthony Holloway, Tulsi Gabbard, I'm Ross Patterson. This is the Drinking Bros Podcast. Good.